My name is Mayra Rodriguez. I'm a former Planned Parenthood director and also known as a whistleblower. Some of you may have heard my story and some of you may not have heard my story, but um, I worked for Planned Parenthood for 17 years. Yes, I know. Every time I say that, I feel the heaviness of people thinking like, what were you thinking for 17 years? My story may be similar to a lot of former abortion workers, but it's also different. Why? Because I know the tactics of Planned Parenthood, even from the moment of hiring employees, not only the women that come and seek the abortion services, but also the employees. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of my background so you will understand why. So I'm Mexican. I grew up in Mexico City. I moved to this country when I was only 17, 18 years of age. I came with a tourist visa. Eventually that visa expired. And I found myself like many people you guys know in the United States without documents. I didn't have documents to work. I had a, a medical lab technician diploma from Mexico City. I went to high school here. I went to community college. I wanted the American dream. I wanted, since I was a child, to work in the medical field, to be a doctor. That's what I wanted to be in my country. When I moved here, that dream got crushed. I couldn't attend university. There was no DACA, no Dream Act. So I couldn't attend university. All I could do was go to community college. So I did. I went to community college. And um, so that's when my story begins. My friend worked for Planned Parenthood. And um, she decided to tell me that there was a job opening available, that they wanted a bilingual person, that they help women. And that's what I did, right? I, I went in there, get a job. They didn't mind my undocumented status. That was not a problem for them. I was truthful to them from the beginning, and they didn't mind. So I was like, this is the American dream. What a nice organization. They really care for women. They care about me. They care about the undocumented community. They care that I get a job working in the medical field, which is my dream, helping women, right? That's what I will be doing, helping women. So the day of the interview started and they said, Myra, what do you think about abortion? Now, I was born and raised Catholic from Mexico City. So obviously abortion was not in my brain, not in my head, not in, in our talk, in our family. So all I did was repeat what I have heard so many times. I wouldn't have an abortion, but if someone else does, that's her body, that's her choice. Now, that is something we hear a lot every day today. I wouldn't have an abortion, but if someone else does, that's her body, that's her choice. And that's how I started working for Planned Parenthood in 2000. Yeah, that was a long time ago. So as a grateful and loyal employee, I was hired to work in non-abortion clinics. And that was a relief to me, you know, when I asked what would my job will be like, and there's, oh, you will be working at the non-abortion clinics. We really want to get the immigrant community involved. We really want to get the immigrant community to come to us. I was like, wow, okay, great. Yeah, I can do that as long as I have nothing to do with abortion. And for many years, they kept their work and they only had me working in clinics that would have nothing to do with abortion. So the years went by. As a loyal employee and as a loyal uh, extreme feminist problem parenthood who will argue with people on the streets, anywhere that I would encounter and be like, no, Planned Parenthood does more than abortions. Planned Parenthood does this. And I will give the long list of services that Planned Parenthood offer at my non-abortion clinic, right? So eventually I became the director of the first non-abortion clinic in North Phoenix. Uh, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. And then eventually after that, I became the director of a second location, which was Flagstaff, Arizona. So now I was managing two clinics. And then in 2016, after being such a loyal employee and working so many years for them and working so hard and tirelessly for women and fighting for women's rights, what a romantic way to call that abortion service, women's rights. I got the Employee of the Year Award. And right after that, they're like, you know what, Myra, you've been with us for so long. This is the end of 2016. That we want you to become the director of the biggest abortion clinic of the state of Arizona. I promise you, my heart froze. Cold shower got into me, but I was undocumented still. I needed the job. That was my excuse. That was my justification. I needed the job. I needed the job to support my family, to support my kids, to be able to have insurance, to be able to have medical insurance. Where else could I go? What else? So basically it was like, Myra, you take this job or you will be out of a job. So I had to take the job. 
or so do I, I thought I had to take it, right? So I became the director of the biggest abortion clinic in the state of Arizona. And this was in 20, the end of 2016. Right away, I started seeing things that were not what I was always told. I was always told that the abortion clinic was just a small percentage of our services, small percentage of the money. You do a lot of big, bigger things that you're not in abortion clinics. And I always live by that. I argue that with people on the street. But why did I see right away? My non-abortion clinic only required to see about 14, 16 patients a day. And that's it. And my abortion clinic, I was required to have 45 patients a day as a goal. That's what they asked me to have, 45 patients a day. At the non-abortion, 16, they will be happy happy with me. That was the goal. Only 16 patients will be available to be seen. And I didn't get in trouble if it wasn't 16 a day. I will get in trouble at the abortion clinic if I didn't have 45 patients per day. Like, how do you want me to get women to come and have abortions? But besides that, money-wise, you know, the amount of money received, every, I mean, just calculate 40, 40, 45 women from ranging from $500 to $900 uh, and, and all this time all that kind of money using it for abortion, correct? And at the location that I didn't have any abortion services, all I had to do uh, provide contraception, well woman exams, birth control, STDs, and the amount of money deposited every day will be about 300 to $400 max, right? Because insurance will usually cover the rest, right? Not all that cash usually that come in during the abortion. In one second, I'm going to quiet the talk just real quick. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry I'm back. Now you will be able to hear me without my dog barking. I apologize truly to everyone. So anyways, I started notice the financial difference between the non-abortion clinics and the abortion clinic. And then I started noticing the amount of money the employees at the abortion clinic were getting paired compared to my employees who had been with the company for many, many years. And it was a really drastic difference. A new employee at the abortion clinic get paid usually two, three dollars more than the employee that started at the non-abortion clinic at the same Planned Parenthood. So I noticed all that. But you know what else I noticed? I noticed the dangers of abortion. All this time behind the curtains in a clinic that it wasn't related to abortion, I didn't get to see how this the tactics of it, you know, the behind the scenes of it. I didn't get to see how the um, abortionists will perforate women and that will go under the rock and he wouldn't even note it in the chart. I didn't get to see how the women were getting hurt under abortion and no one was doing anything about it. You know, I, I wasn't seeing the falsifying of patient charge, which is what I noticed when I became the director of this abortion clinic, specifically with an abortionist. He was falsifying the patient charge, meaning whatever happened in the room, he will not notate on patient chart. He wouldn't even talk to the patients about it. Also, the perforations of the years that happen more frequently that they like to tell people that happens. That was still under the rug. He will not document that on the chart. Why? Because they didn't want the health department to find out all oh, these women being perforated. Also, you know, uh, overseeing things like on the medical charge from patients so they could go ahead and do the abortions. Also, you notify, not notifying about minors being impregnated by adults, which is a reportable offense in the state of Arizona. It's a minor, a 15 year old with a 23 year old being pregnant by him. You know, so all these issues that I kept complaining and complaining and complaining. But everyone usually asked me, okay, Myra, so what was what was the drop? Like, what was it for Myra? What was the before, before and after? And I will explain to you what happened. So there was one day specifically that I remember so vivid on my uh, memory. And it was a 19-year-old that came in for an abortion. She was 14 weeks pregnant. Now, um, I'm going to be a bit explicit when I explain to you how an abortion after 13 weeks is done, because I find very important for people to know that this remember that happens to babies that are after 13 weeks. And the way that happened is that they start by 
uh, dilating the women and then pulling out the baby part, right? And that's when you have seen, if you have seen a movie about it or some YouTube videos about it, you have seen employees trying to uh, make back a puzzle in another room, trying to put the pieces of the babies together, right? And that's what happens, right? Because the doctor, it's ripping apart the legs, the arms, the torso, the head, right? So this happened because she was 14 weeks. Now, usually uh, the doctor in the state of Arizona, by law, has to make sure that everything has been accounted for. That there's a head, there's two arms, there's a torso, there's two legs, there's two feet, there's two hands. But he didn't want to do that. He will constantly not follow the law and sign the affidavit long before he will even enter in the room. He will be signing um, these forms. He will make the employee sign the forms too, and they will all sign it before they even saw the patient. Sometimes they will sign three of the patients ahead without even seeing the patients first. So that's breaking the law. And he will force employees to do that too. So in this situation, the employee came out of the room, went and checked and, and armed the puzzle about the baby, right? And noticed that the head was missing. So she went back to the room and said to the abortionist, you know, it's not complete. The head is missing. And he said, go look again, go look everywhere. And she did. She went out and looked again and looked everywhere. And then what he was doing was inserting an IUD in the meantime. So she went out and was looking on the jars. There's this um, glass jars that are used on the medical aspiration. And then she looked on all the instruments. And then she went back. And then he said, uh, well, it's not here. You didn't find it somewhere in there. You know, so he was leaving the room. So she got very worried. And then she went into my office and almost to the point of crying, very concerned. She said, Myra, he's ready to leave the room and he's missing the head. I already told him he's not listening. So why do I explain how the staff member came out and talked to me about it concern? In a way, also part of my mission and testimony is to tell everyone that an abortion worker, it's not an evil person. I'm not saying all of them. Of course, there's bad and good people everywhere. But for the majority part, a lot of the abortion workers are really truly thinking they're helping women. They really think they're there for the women helping them. So in this case, you know, the concern of this staff member, you know, another staff member, someone with not such a good heart or someone that didn't care would have gone, okay, fine. It, it's his patient. He's the doctor. If something happens to her, that's his problem. I did my job, right? But she didn't. She was so concerned about it that she brought the director, me, to the back to talk to the doctor. So I did. And I said, doctor, it seems that you are missing still some parts of the baby. And he said, I already told you to look in the trash. That did it. You know, I remember the day, I remember his face, I remember his voice, my stomach got twisted, my heart was frozen again, I had that cold shower feeling, and I was like, it's a human being, it's a 14-week baby, he just referred as trash. So after arguing with him and forcing him, he agreed to go back in the room to find that he left the baby head inside that woman above the IUD that he had already already inserted. Now, for some of the audience that don't know what an IUD is, it's a device used as contraception that gets inserted on the euros, and it's a T, usually made out of copper, or um, there's one with hormones, which made out of plastic. So the head was right above the IUD. That 19-year-old had two abortions, two DNCs. They scraped her euros twice. They inserted that IUD twice in less than 30 minutes. And no one told her. He didn't document on his chart. He didn't even say anything to the patient. They treated it like everything was normal. That's what I, he actually put in the chart, that he had done the abortion without complications. So I complained. I left that day. I called my boss and I said, no more. You do something about it, I will do something about it. I don't care. I have to go to the health department, medical board, whatever I need to go, I will do something about it. What happened next is they fired Myra. Yeah, the loyal employee, the employee that had been with them for 17 years, you know, the one they had just praised a few months before uh, on an event, giving her the Employee of the Year Award, Myra was fired. Well, I was gone. Uh, remember, I was managing three clinics at the same time. They sent me to supervise another clinic. And while I was gone, um, 
they scheduled me for a meeting and they say, Mayor, you're fired because while you were gone last Friday from Glendale, we found narcotics on your desk. Yeah, that was the accusation they did to me. So I knew they were trying to set me up. I knew that their goal was to protect the abortionist at all costs, not the patient, not the employee, not the loyal employee, not the other employee who complained about him, but the abortionist because he's the money making. It's easier for them to find another director. And they did within 90 days, they had another director replacing me, but it's a lot harder for them to find an abortionist, of course. And that's the money making. So as undocumented, I was like, oh my God, I don't have a job. What am I gonna do? My work crash, I had two kids. I was by myself with my two kids, one starting college, one still in high school. What am I gonna do? How can I do anything about it? The pro-life movement from Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, I always like to tell this story. There was this lady praying outside of the clinic all the time. When I tell you all the time, it's like she's been doing that for many, many years, 20, 30 years. When she stopped seeing that Myra didn't show up, you know, she's like, well, Myra's always here. Myra's here seven days a week. Myra's the first one in the clinic. Myra's the last one to leave. What happened to Myra? Who does that, right? Who is worried about the medic, the director of the abortion clinic, this woman, this lady who got worried about me and found a way to get my phone number. And then she called me and said, Myra, what happened? You didn't show up to work. And I'm like, you should be celebrating that I'm no longer there. And she said, I am, but I'm worried about you because you were a loyal employee. You were always here. And then from night to day, you disappeared. So then she invited me for lunch. And then I started my emotional healing, my spiritual healing, and then also we found a lawyer. So I found my lawyer with the help of all the community. Now it's time to see the lawyer, right? And as a documented person, I promise you, it is hard to make a choice of starting a lawsuit in a country where you shouldn't even be here, right? Where you could be deported all the time. I mean, I live in fear almost my whole life since I got to this country of thinking that if I get stopped by a police officer, that if I ever get in trouble, I will be deported and move to a country that I ran away from because of the violence, right? So, but I had to do something about it. So I went and talked to this lawyer and then I explained my story and then I told him what happened and he believed me. You know, that's the most important part. He believed in me. So when I told him this story, I also told him, but I have to tell you, I'm undocumented. And he said, that doesn't matter. You're a human being. You have right. And we will defend your right. Now, I knew at that moment that there could be a chance that at the moment of trial in the state of Arizona, if an undocumented person is facing a judge um, in the justice system, he, that person could be deported because the judge cannot look the other way about the immigration status. So he said that. He said, you know, Myra, the only thing we won't be able to do anything about it is your immigration status. You get to that point, um, you get deported. There won't be much we can do. And I said, that's fine. You know, I knew that there was a chance that I had to move back to Mexico, but I had to do it. I had to do it. And why did I do it? I did it for two reasons. Number one, because women deserve to know the truth about abortion. Women deserve to know the truth about Planned Parenthood. The deception I felt on my heart when I realized they were ready to protect the abortionists at all costs, even threatening me to be deported and accusing me of having narcotics on my desk, knowing that I didn't do any of those things. At that moment, I knew people need to know the truth about Plum Parenthood. Also, I did it for the immigrant community. You see, as an immigrant, I just told you, I live been fear my whole life. And just like me, there's plenty of immigrants, undocumented immigrants that are constantly in fear. They get abused by their workers. Uh, some women at the field get raped by the foremen of the field. You know, I mean, the abuse and a lot of undocumented people happens constantly and daily, but they stay quiet because obviously they would rather go through that abuse then go back to the country where they suffer violence, where they suffer hunger, or where they can't even know if tomorrow they will be alive. So I had to do something for that community too. I have to show the big corporations, the big employers, that sometimes the underdog wins. And sometimes, you know, justice is on the right side and it will help the one without the money because that was a scary part. 
Planned Parenthood has a lot of money. They share up to court with their big lawyers from New York, you know, a big law firm from Phoenix, Arizona. And knowing that I was fighting not only a corporation, an international corporation and a lot of money. It was scary. I'm not going to lie to you. The actual lawsuit lasted for two years. The trial lasted for two weeks. I was very scared about if they could try something against me. You know, they had already put everyone against me. I mean, one of the hardest part about a trial in this kind of situations is watching what who you thought they were your friends, your co-workers, people you had been with for many years, you know, almost you see them as family, right? Because you're there with them all the time. I mean, sometimes work is our second home. And watching them betray you, you know, watching them turn their back on you. One thing I will always be grateful is that when the employees testify and they were asked about my character, most of them spoke great about me. They said that I was a loyal employee, that I followed the protocol, that I followed rules, that I was a hard working employee. So I do appreciate that they were truthful about that. Some of them did, did have the courage to speak the truth about what the abortion has done. And that's what helped us, right? So in 2019, August of 2019, I won a lawsuit against a lot because I, I was documented. By the way, I'm no longer undocumented, so I don't have to be afraid anymore. My status was readjust. But I won a lawsuit against Planned Parenthood in August of 2019. And, you know, the best part about it was that the jury, uh, the majority of jury were all pro-abortion, pro-Planned Parenthood. You know, they get interviewed right before trial, and they all said that they were for Planned Parenthood, that they like what Planned Parenthood does for the community. So the moment when they unanimously said that Planned Parenthood fired me wrongfully under the Whistleblowing Protection Act, which I'm grateful that we have in the state of Arizona, that we have in this country, you know, that felt even better because my truth convinced a site that was for Planned Parenthood. You know, my truth was shown there and these people who were for Planned Parenthood, work for abortion, put their beliefs aside, put their whatever political party was aside to just look at the truth and we won and that's how i became a pro-life activist today i go around the world speaking my story speaking my testimony and the truth behind abortion the truth behind about Planned parenthood and what's going on in the united states what's going on in other countries but why am i doing that well you just saw on the previous panel this lady from ecuador and you saw these people from russia and ireland and japan Planned Parenthood, it's not only in the United States. There are international Planned Parenthood, and they're huge. I mean, when I tell you they're huge, is they have more affiliates than McDonald's has locations. When I say that, most people drop their jaw and they're like, really? And I'm like, yes, really. The difference between McDonald's and Planned Parenthood is that McDonald's goes around the world calling themselves McDonald's. They're very proud of their Big Mac, right? They're very proud of having Big Mac, they're having French fries and having all their products that they're so famous for in the United States, right? But Planned Parenthood doesn't do that. Planned Parenthood is called Mexfam in Mexico. It's called FUSA in Argentina. It's called many different names in all the countries. And they are funded by the same money Planned Parenthood in the United States is, our money. So our tax dollars are not only paying for abortions in our own country. Our American tax dollars are not only helping destroy the life of many women, they're also doing that across the globe. They're helping destroy the life of women in Latin America, in Central America, in the open seas, in Europe, in many other continents. And that's why I joined this fight internationally. I saw the need of going, starting with Mexico, why? And I've been saying this for a, for a year since I've been public, every time I speak in Mexico, we have to fight because Planned Parenthood wants a location at every city in our border because they know that the pro-life movement in the United States is growing and it will affect their business. The proof, Texas passed that law and started on September 1st, a few days right before the Mexican government put in their schedule, they're going to pass to the Supreme Court legalizing abortion in the entire country. Why? Because they know the IPPF, International Plumper and Federation, needs to make up the laws 
from the state of Texas. And they know that many other states will follow that path. And that will hurt their business, right? And when I say that will hurt their business, is that Planned Parenthood loses millions of dollars when they can perform abortions in a few clinics in a few states. Now, how do I know that? Because I was a director for 17 years. I was a director for Planned Parenthood, and I know how much money they can lose. After learning the abortion business, then I knew the amount of money involved and what happens with that money. And when I tell you the amount of money involved is the daily deposit sleep from uh, my location at the abortion clinics was over 10 grand. Over $10,000 were deposited into Planned Parenthood accounts just from abortions happening in one location. The Planned Parenthood in Arizona has about three abortion clinics. Now, lately, they've been having a hard time finding abortionists. So something we're doing, it's right. A lot of doctors are not wanting to be associated with Planned Parenthood. And, and that is a win for us. But we also have to think about the private abortionist. A lot of these doctors that have worked for Planned Parenthood, and specifically speaking about the one that I accuse. So yes, Planned Parenthood got rid of him, of course, you know, because that's what Planned Parenthood does. You know, when they have like a doctor they don't want to be associated with because that's bad press, then they finish their contract. The doctor has to move away, but they don't do anything about it. They don't do anything to his license. He could continue to practice. Basically, they throw him back in the street, and that's what they did. The doctor opened his own private practice in Tucson, Arizona, and now he provides medical abortions and medical marijuana. Why does he provide medical marijuana? Well, we know that women that have suffered abortion end up having an addiction to alcohol, drugs, marijuana, or something else because they feel sad. They feel sad for the rest of their life. A lot of them are not able to heal. You know, a lot of the questions I get usually, it's like, Myra, what would the women look like when they came to the clinic? And I would say, you know, when you saw them coming to the clinic, they have this look of hopeful. They feel that this will be finishing soon, that in 15 minutes, the life will go on, that they keep, keep moving forward. You know, they can go back to school. That's what they were promised, right? Don't worry. It only takes 15 minutes and then you can go back to normal, back to normal, right? That's what they tell them. They look scared. Of course, they look scared. They don't know what's going to happen to them, you know, but they have that hopeful face. That hopeful face, it's done after the abortion. They don't look hopeful anymore. They actually look sad scared most of them don't even understand what happened to them because most of them it's not like the abortionist walks into the room and says hey good morning jane doe my name is blah 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 and i will perform your abortion today and this is what i'm gonna do to you you know i'm gonna go in and dilate you and aspirate you and then scrape your uterus and you know while i'm doing that this may happen i may perforate your intestines i may perforate your uterus i may perforate all their organs you may die you may bleed to death you may get an infection no it's not like he does that you know this woman was given a form long before you know for her to read it and do you understand what you've read and said yes okay well, uh, this is your nurse. I'm going to give you some medication to kind of put you in a twilight sedation. Uh, you may not remember anything. Uh, you may not feel anything. Uh, if you feel it, you will not remember, right? So, and then once she's knocked out, that's when the abortionist walks into the room. He performs the abortion. Then he's done with the abortion and moves other he does it in less than 15 minutes. You know, he has to move in a fast pace because obviously he wants to see a lot of patients in one day. So he finishes the abortion and moves on to the next one and moves on to the next one. So when the patient wakes up, she's moving to um, a recovery room, right? Which is like literally five minutes after that aspiration. And then she's moved to the recovery room. She's sitting on a table. She's giving some Sprite crackers, and then 15 minutes after that, you know, if she's not bleeding heavily, then she send out. They open the back door, they give it to the person who dropped her off, and that's it. They're done with her. You know, they don't ask you how you feel about it. Are you sad? You know, how you're feeling about it. Actually, I heard a nurse tell one lady this. Oh, you're feeling sad about it? That's normal. You know, if you start birth control, your hormones will get back into balance very quickly. Yes, I heard him said that, and I said, what? And you say, well, yeah, it's their hormones. Or so if we tell them that, that will make them feel better. Yes, that's what they tell them. You know, so 
these women never get to see their abortionist. You know, they're told the name of the abortionist, but they actually never met the abortionist. So when they leave the clinic, they're confused. They don't know what happens to them. And if you have spoken to any um, pregnancy centers that have seen women after their abortion, a lot of the women say that. Yesterday, I had a visit with eight women center in Tempe. And I was talking to one of the workers there and she said, you know, the patient asked me, so what did they do to me? Because I don't remember anything. You know, when the doctor explained to her the detail of her abortion, she said like, that's why I'm in so much pain. You know, a lot of women don't understand that scraping that the abortionist does to their gears leaves scars. And then they wonder two or three, five years later, why? I can have babies, why I can get pregnant again after one abortion. You know, one thing for sure is we don't know how many abortions a woman had before she became sterile. It could be the first one, it could be the second one. The second thing we know is that having the ab first abortion is the hardest one. After they had their first abortion, it's easier for them to have the second, the third, the fourth. I had a patient who had 20 abortions and she was only 45. So it's easy for them to repeat after the first one. And that's why the pro-life woman comes in place. You know, trying to win that battle when that woman walks into their clinic and it's the first one, it's ideal. But also being there for them afterwards, you know, knowing that you will be there for them because Planned Parenthood will not offer any psychological or emotional or any psychiatric help nothing like they're done with them they are done once they've done their abortion their business is done that's it they don't care what happens to them afterwards right only they care if they come back for the birth control knowing that most of those women will fall on the birth control again you know so and now i'm going to talk to you about how we're trying to convince women on having an abortion right the selfish right so the way we're training it, you get this 16 year old 17 year old right and then you tell her oh okay so you're pregnant wow that must be so hard you're so young right and don't you want to finish school well yeah i, I do want to finish school and what are your parents are going to say about it are they going to kick you out i mean they're going to be super mad at you right well you know but my boyfriend said he will support me you know, they all say that eventually he'll leave you. Eventually he will walk out on you because that's what they do. You know, we have seen it many times, you know? So, I mean, you can still have an abortion, you know, and um, you won't even need your parental consent. I mean, you are 17, but in this state, we can help you get a bypass, judicial bypass, so you don't have to get parental permission. That's in states that require parental permission. California, New York, and other states don't require parental permission. So a 12-year-old, 10-year-old can have an abortion without her parents' permission. So um, it, these women are told this tragic story about their future of their life if they decide to have a child. And then that's when Planned Parenthood, the hero, comes into play saying, but we can help you. We can help you get that abortion and move on with your life. You know, no one will have to know, you know, like you just have to get someone to drive you uh, from the clinic to your house. And that's even, you know, because one of the deals they have with Lyft, and I will mention this because I saw their ad this morning, they're email that they send to all their drivers about how they will donate a million dollars to Planned Parenthood. And that's because Planned Parenthood and Lyft have a deal that the patients will be sent home with a Lyft driver if they don't have another driver, you know, and Planned Parenthood will help them pay for that. So, which is the scary part, right? Because a lot of the times these women are still kind of under the influence of the medication they were given. And remember, Lyft was accused for sexual harassment on, on a lot of their, uh, a lot, a lot of the customers that use them. So, can you imagine? It's like sending someone drunk with a Lyft driver, and not that person won't remember if something happens to them. But that's what they do. You know, they send them when they don't have someone to pick them up. So that's why their connection comes. I just thought it was good for you all to know that, right? That's why they were so generous donating to Planned Parenthood a million dollars, right? So um, anyway, so this woman, it's told her tragic story. And let's talk about the woman that has three or four kids, right? So she shows up. Oh, you're pregnant again. Oh, wow. And you already have three? 
Yeah. And how's your financial situation? Oh, okay. And how's your marriage? Yeah, it's tough. You know, I, I know. I mean, in bringing another kid into that situation, yeah. I mean, you have to split the food in all your three kids. You know, now there will be four suffering. If you really love that child, see, this is where if you love that child, you will kill him. You will abort him and not bring him to this world suffering. You know, and this is how they start telling people and they start telling women that killing your baby, it's actually an act of love. As an employee, I remember a, a female doctor that worked there. Um, she will tell me, what do you want? That drug addict having children? No, this is for the good of that baby. You don't want her to have a child coming into this world and the child being another drug addict thanks to her. That's what she will say. You know, they don't care about women. You know, they look at it as the kids from these women will be trouble in the future, you know, because the women, the sick abortion, should, it's the women should not be mothers. That's what she said. You know, I said, I'll be you, I said, abortion is that cares for women. No, they don't. You know what I learned during my time as a director of Planned Parenthood? Of the abortion clinic is that the abortionists don't care about women they're doing it for money they're doing it because to them it's a business and it's a well-paid business another funny part of my story it, it's that as a director of the non-abortion clinics i was in charge of all the pay of every single staff member of my clinic from the clinician to my assistant to anyone i could see how much the money they were making, when was their last raise, everything about it. But as the abortion director, I didn't get to see the abortionist salary. I had to provide a list of the numbers of abortions he had done. How many abortions were below nine weeks? How many abortions were below 10 weeks, 11 weeks, and so on and so forth, because he will get paid by the amount of weeks that patient was done, you know, the abortion pill. You know, I never get to see a single paycheck for that abortion. And nor was I allowed to see how much he will get paid per patient. I found that fishy too. Yes, because not letting the director see how much the abortionist was getting paid because they don't want the world to know how much an abortionist is making, right? And that happens all the time. You know, when I came out, I met a lot of former abortion workers. I can... Today, I will be honest with you. I was hoping that it was only these abortionists that I was working with in the state of Arizona. My heart really wished that this was only happening at the Planned Parenthood in Arizona. But then I came out and I started talking to former abortion workers, not only in the United States, but around the world. And that was not true. That is happening in every abortion facility in the world. They've seen what I have seen. And that's what I told you at the beginning, the deception, right? You give your life, your 17 years of your life to this corporation. I call them today a corporation, not an organization. You give the, your life to this corporation to just get a huge deception from them. You know, if you all um, have read the story about um, the former CEO, Wen, Dr. Wen, and when she speaks about the deception, you know, that... For many years, she was like, yes, Planned Parenthood, and she was so excited to become their CEO. And then she find out that abortion was the only thing in their mind. She suffered that same deception. And that's what most of former abortion workers said. You know, they started, we all started thinking we were helping women. And of course, that's a way to justify ourselves, right? I, I have many excuses for working for them, from my undocumented status to helping women. You know, at the end, today, I realized that I helped the abortion industry in many ways. I even at the non-abortion clinics, right? I keep saying, but I work at the non-abortion clinics. That was my justification of helping them make money, of helping them hurt women, of helping them kill all these babies. So today, I am still for women. You know, I fight for women for all women, born and unborn. I fight for all women rights, and that starts at the womb. You know, I fight to tell the truth about abortion. I fight to tell the truth about Planned Parenthood and the abortionists and what are they doing and why this is a big business. And I welcome you to follow up organizations like Pro-Life San Francisco that constantly is investigating of what they're doing at the University of California, practicing with the unborn babies, right? And I welcome you to check all the websites there are about embryonic um, 
embryonic experimentation, right? Cell, uh, embryonic cells, right? Experimentation. So do your research, tell your friends, this business is huge. They're not only hurting women, they're not only killing babies inside the womb, but they are actually trafficking with them, right? They're using every single part of the abortion industry to make money, you know? And it is not easy for me to admit that I was wrong for 17 years, but I always thank God that he opened my eyes. I always thank the people that have welcomed me in the pro-life movement, special organizations like Rehumanize International, which I am deeply fond of, because not only do they care about the unborn, they care about everything that is happening, that it's social justice. And that's what abortion is. This is not a religious issue. This is not a political party. This has nothing to do with being Republican, with being Democrat. This has nothing to do with being white. You know, I'm tired of hearing people say that the pro-life movement, it's from male, white, Christians, Republicans. No, it's not. It's from many of us from different colors, different races, different countries that are fighting for the social justice of the most vulnerable person, the unborn, the tiny one, the voiceless, the ones that have nothing, they cannot have nothing to defend themselves because they only rely on us, their mothers, right? And that death penalty to the unborn has to stop. We have to stop the death penalty of the unborn, the pregnancy, could be prevented. It is their body and it is their choice, but that choice has to be made before they have someone else's body inside them. So I think I'm coming to the end of my presentation and I haven't seen if you guys have questions, so I'm gonna check on the Q&A and see uh, the first one. Oh, there you go, Kai. I was just gonna say that there are ones in the Q&A, wanna make sure you got that, but since you know where it is, then that my work here is done. And I yeah, you want to do that. I'm always happy if you wanna read them. No, please, you go for it. You can read them out loud and then uh, people can see it from there. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Stay here with me. What can the pro-life movement do? What can the pro-life movement do to be more welcoming towards the immigrant community? You know, well, one thing I found out when I was working with Planned Parenthood, they will tell the immigrant community that because most of the pro-life women, it's Republican, all pro-life women is Republican, they don't want you here. They will deport you in cold ice. So, you know, reassuring. We're working um, really hard with Democrats for like creating um, Hispano Democrat Pro Vida, we call in Spanish, pro-life, you know, to tell the Latino community that that's not true, that this movement, it's not about being Republican, that there's many politicians that are Democrat and they are fighting for the unborn. So we're hoping that this could help. We're also working with a lot of pro-life organizations in the border of creating at least to give uh, the pro-life community and the Latino community about locations where they can be helped without having nothing to do with the abortion. See, Planned Parenthood has sided with a lot of pro-immigrant organizations, giving them money. And of course, that's a big part of their movement, right? Money. And I hear that all the time. And I'm like, yes, they're super rich, right? So um, we're trying to create this resource list for this immigrant community so they know there's places where they can go that have nothing to do with abortion, right? They're getting more... Um, knowledgeable about abortion because abortion is becoming legal in their home countries. So now they're hearing more about it, right? So that's one thing we can do to welcome them. Um, how have your diary responded to your story? Did they work alongside? Oh my God, that's such a great question because that has been my biggest challenge. I have a 22 year old daughter and a 19 year old boy. And you can imagine, I raised them at Planned Parenthood. I mean, when I told you I raised them at that silly march i had my daughter with me chanting my body my choice do i regret that so much so that has been my biggest challenge i mean right away they were against plant parenthood obviously because i'm their mother and they were team myra but they were still kind of confused about okay so abortion is good abortions are good is abortion good in certain situations i can tell you today very proudly that my two kids see abortion and that's wrong you know, actually, my son has volunteered for some pro-life organizations and, you know, they both have joined the pro-life movement. Um, my daughter lives in New York, so obviously this is a more liberal state. And 
she's actually, you know, saying like, yeah, abortion is wrong. You know, when you can prevent a pregnancy, abortion is wrong. There's no excuse for this. So but that was my hardest challenge about not trying to convince people, you know, forget about people who met me before, you know, who hardly ever talks to me now, you know, but trying to change the mind of my kids that I created, it has been my biggest challenge. So thank you for your question. Um, let's see, I have, is it true that Plumper has a minimum quota for abortions per location? Yes, they do. Sadly, like I said, you know, I was forced to see 40 patients uh, at the 40 to 45 patients at the abortion location in Glendale, Arizona, and only about 16 patients at the non-abortion clinic. In the, in the city of Los Angeles, there's an, a, a Planned Parenthood clinic downtown LA that has four abortions. Each one of them sees about 40 patients a day, one clinic in Los Angeles. They have about nine just downtown LA. You can imagine the amount of abortions they're doing in Los Angeles. So, oh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. You know, um, I don't see myself as a hero. I see you all as heroes. You know, you've been doing the pro-life movement your whole life and i really i am grateful that you welcome me and and that you open your arms to me and, and that i don't get criticized i don't get judged by you by any of you never you know every time i speak in public every time i have an appearance and people hug me and tell me stuff like that you know i don't deserve it i only did what was right which i mean that's what everyone should be doing you know it still shocks me that former employer workers or other abortion workers were there for so long and didn't speak about it. You know, I only lasted 10 months at the abortion clinic. I couldn't take it, to be honest with you. So I only did what it was right, what it was right for women and the unborn. But thank you so much, Sarah. And Dean Rogers, from what I have read, PP is fundamentally very consistently anti-labor. Lots of union busting with the help of Trump. Why are your tongues and protesting man on this ground? Yes, actually, you know, my lawyer brought up during my trial on how they were abusing my undocumented status by paying me less than other managers because we discovered that, you know, I didn't know that. You know, here's Myra working, managing three clinics, and then one day I... I mean, during the trial, my lawyer made them release the salary of all the other abortion um, or other um, directors. And it seemed that I was getting paid less than even just an assistant manager in another clinic, in managing three clinics. So, I mean, we did go through the labor law on my lawsuit. It was... Um, uh, wrongful termination so it did have to do with labor and that's where we started from so we're hoping that more um, employees come forward about the injustice about their uh, during labor laws too you know and create a um, bigger complaint about it right and kyle murphy myra did pp know that hey, you were myra, actually just just to jump in you probably didn't see because you're on the q a but uh, herb actually asked you to wrap up because we have some networking going on um, okay, perfect. And the next question was mine, and you already answered it anyway in your previous answer. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. And I know no one, else can, no one else can give their appreciation right now, but thank you so much for your session. This was fantastic.